Welcome to Above the Garage. Hi, friends. Today we have a very exciting bonus episode of our Your Honor podcast, an interview with Peter Sollett, director of episodes one and two of this season, as well as the upcoming episodes five and six, which we cannot wait for. He has also just finished directing the show Evil and many movies like Nick and Nora's Infinite Playlist, which you may have heard of, as well as Raising Victor Vargas, which he did with his wife, Eva Vives, also a director, which you should watch immediately. Anyway, I really hope that you enjoy this interview as much as we did. Hi. Hello. How are you? Great. How are you? Hughes. I'm good. It's very nice to meet you. Likewise. Where are you today? I am in Philly. Kimberly, she's in Perth. I guess it's warmer where you are. Is it nice? Did it stop raining? Uh, Finally, yeah. Um, 60-ish? 60? Yeah. I'd take that. There's snow flurries and I'm over it. Yeah. I've lived in California a few times. I like bounce back and forth. And it's around this time of year where I hate myself for leaving because winter gets very old around February. Yeah, no, I know. It's cute until the holidays. And then New Year's. Right after, yeah. Fun, and then you want to die. Yep, it's exactly. Really January 1st, honestly. I'm like, oh, all right. Yeah, because the only, I, when I was in California for Christmas and it was hot and I was like, oh, this sucks, but now it's worth it. <laughs> it's worth it for the rest. Yeah. I don't have that problem. It's always hot for Christmas in Australia. Who knew? Mm-hmm. I guess that makes a lot of sense, but I hadn't thought of it before. Yeah. yeah. Like two Christmases ago, it was like 45 degrees. Oh, you guys don't know that, do you? Like, Which yeah. in, in our language is like a hundred and some. I know that. Yeah. Hundred like thirteen or something. Yeah. Oh Jesus. I want that's that's a lot. Yeah. I had 37 winters or 38 winters, and now I'm good. I've had enough. I can be here for a while. <laughs> did you just go to New York for school or did you grow up? I don't know. I grew up in New York. I'm from New oh, York. Nice. And um, you know, left in my middle thirties and um a good time to be warm. I get to go back a lot and work and have fun and be a tourist. And Mm -hmm. see my friends and family, and it's great. The best of both worlds. Yeah. Yeah. You were in New York. You were directing Evil. I was directing Evil. Yeah. I mean, I have, you know, Liz Glotzer and Robert Michelle King, the producing team behind. Mm -hmm. We've heard of them. Yeah, I'm sure. (laughs) They've done some quality work. Um, You know, and they're the ones I have to thank for being part of of your honor. And of course, Brian and, and Joey Hartstone, the showrunner of uh of season two but you know evil has been a very special production to me um i came on in the first season and it has really been a thrill to to be a part of it that's awesome the show has such a specific tone really feels like there's a unique singular voice and intelligence behind it um and that's where i was until a couple of weeks ago having fun uh, awesome stage 17 in greenpoint brooklyn oh nice <laughs> So you and your wife are both directors. I must, I have to know, are your, are your home videos like phenomenal? The home videos are messy. The stills are good. I mean, <laughs> we've been the stills of each other for 25 years. Mm-hmm. And I watched Raising Victor Vargas. It was so good. And it's cool that you got to create something like that with your wife. It's something we're very proud of. I really love that movie. Yeah. And the beauty of it is, is that we've made some lifelong friends and collaborators. So that one was really a gift. Yeah. I've heard a lot about all of you. How did you come to make this podcast? Um, We were just talking on the cesspool of the internet on Reddit. And we were talking about handmaids. And we decided, I suggested, let's start a podcast. Yeah. Yeah, it was really fun. So that's that's what we did. We caught up quick. And it was like really, it went over really well. It was really successful as far as the cast and the crew and it's been really fun and nice getting to know everybody and they've been awesome so we wanted to do more well we're glad you did us we're lucky you chose us i loved your honor i'm a little jealous of your new orleans filming i think that would be really fun i've only spent a weekend there but it was an excellent weekend it was a lot of fun it's really hot i mean we were i was there in the summer in the middle of the summer and it was brutal Um, (laughs) Really tough, you know. I mean, yeah. true story. There's in season two, episode one, there's a scene when, well, Benji is the actor's name, but um, Eugene, you know, right. was running away from Carlo. And we did that on Bourbon Street, and the street was open. It was a Friday night. We'd get that location. He ran down, he ran instead of the chase once and fell down and vomited. Oh my God. You know, the humidity was just horrifying. So everything oh, you see man. On his his one run down that yeah. down that block. You didn't want to ask him to get up and run it again after that. 
No, it was made clear to us that he, I mean, I think he wanted to give it a go, but the, the medic said that it, no, no, we're not, sure that. not safe. Well, it was an excellent run. Yeah. yeah, I love that you picked up where it left off, because at first it seemed like maybe we weren't going to see the immediate aftermath of the end of season one, and I really enjoyed that you did show us that. Yes, Joey Hartstein loves a direct pickup from uh, a previous yeah. season, and uh, I think that worked really well. I like that a lot. Yeah. He wrote the first episode, is he right? Any further down the line? Uh, he well, I don't know. I mean, I only know I only know the four that I did. He did one, and he did. He may have a co-written by credit on another one of the ones I directed, but I'm not sure. I'm sure he did. Yeah, Bruce of Handmaid's Tale fame does um, the first and the last. So I was wondering if he maybe did that. That would be my expectation. I, I don't. Yeah. I, but I haven't seen ten yet, so I'm not sure. You haven't seen it. Do you know what happens? Uh, no. That's exciting. No, no, I have the script, but I didn't. I want to see it. I, I just want to be an audience member. I don't want to read it. I love that. Well, it's more fun to see it perform. Yeah. Yeah, I read up until six, and then I thought, well, great. Now I can be an audience member for seven, eight, nine, and ten. I love <laughs> that. Yeah, I have the scripts, but I'd rather just see the finished product. You know. I don't. Mm-hmm. I fear I wouldn't have the self restraint. Yeah. But I, I like the idea that. very much. <laughs> yeah. No, I'll be watching ten with you on uh, a couple of weeks from now. That's awesome. Did you watch, were you a fan before you were a director of the show? Yeah, God, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how you could not be with this cast in this genre, right? I mean, Brian, uh, Mr. Stuhlbarg, Ms. Davis, uh, Margo Martindale, um, all, you know, all of these actors are are standouts. And in a crime thriller, it's, uh, it's perfect. It's an unbelievable cast. And that, I mean, the acting is just phenomenal. There's no, there's no weakness. It was uh, really well done. And anything that Brian wants to do, I'm going to look for. Exactly. Um, But yes, very much so. How incredible. This is the first time you've worked with him, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is he, is he as awesome as he seems? He is. Yeah. I think he sets a very high bar in terms of script um, Mm. and production um, and on set he you know he is just an incredibly seasoned actor who treats everybody like uh, a mentor a coach uh, a cheerleader so you know that's the kind of leading man you want right is he pretty involved in like the direct you said the script so I guess he's involved in the scripts process before it's finalized or just during the filming yeah well he's an executive producer of the show so he's in on he's in right. on the story from from go right I think they did a great job because honestly, when I heard there was a season two, I was like, but how? Like, it seemed pretty uh, final, the ending, if you will. And it's it's been so good. Well, when I met him, you know, he explained it to me and it made perfect sense. What he said was, is that the original concept was that the first season was going to be about the downfall of a of a man. And the second right. section of the story was going to be a redemption story uh, or a resurrection story, perhaps. I'm not sure which word he would choose. Mm-hmm. Uh, but those two words come to mind for me. So it was something on his mind before, because I thought it was a limited series and that was all that had been planned. But then I have questions like Robin's death. They make it intriguing without resolving that in any way. So that made me think that, you know, they must have had an open mind about a future. I I have to imagine that Showtime did. I don't know. You know, I knew that I know that Brian had in his mind that there could be a, a second section of the story for Desiato, but I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't really know. You'd have to ask him. You should ask. Him. Yeah, I'd love to ask him. <laughs> um, Breaking Bad is is one of the only shows that, for me, completely stuck the landing. You know, like there are a lot of shows I love for many seasons. Yeah, and it doesn't doesn't work out in the end. To um, you know, Game of Thrones <laughs> um, and others. So I feel good though. I feel good with Brian Cranston being involved. It's going to be a great resolution. Yes. So. Is it easier to direct a dog, a bull, or a baby? Um, in this case, a baby. <laughs> that baby's so cute. There's lots to cover yeah. with all of the, with the dog, the bull, and the baby, and some worthwhile anecdotes. But I should start with the baby because this is the best. This was the best. First of all, I should tell you that there are two babies. Two babies. Okay. Usually twins, right? Yeah. This is common practice in any film or television production. Logical. Twins. Um, both live here in California. And the reason that you have two babies, of course, is that, you know, if the baby, if one of the babies falls asleep, you can't wake up the baby to come perform. Mm. <laughs> one of the babies- You can't shake the baby. You can't shake the baby. <laughs> if one of the babies is supposed to be asleep and the other one's up, you can bring the sleeping one. Yeah. And they were great. The, the first baby shot we did was the episode two baby reveal where, oh. where Fia reveals the baby to Brian. Very shocking, sir. First take, Lily came- 
as Fia brings the baby up to Brian, the baby looks to Brian, smiles, and looks back at Lily. Oh, no. and we were all stunned. We got it. It was down on film, down on video. I said, God. Brian turned around <laughs> and mouthed, holy shit. Right? That baby's a good actor. None of us had ever seen a baby perform like that. That's unbelievable. <laughs> and that's what's, in, that's what's in the show, is that first take. Harder was, the next day we had to shoot the baby cry. Uh, uh, well, it was a scene where Carlo was looking down into the crib. He has left the baby in Carlo's care. And um, he's texting the gal from the from the lobby. That baby was grumpy that day um <laughs> but uh but yeah they're very good kids also two jangos <gasps> there's two oh jangos my God, reveal. we can each have one kimberly yay you can have one, yeah. there's an east coast jango and a west coast jango oh my god um, so when we're in new orleans you get new orleans jango and when you're in los angeles you get oh. california jango that's amazing so it is a breed then it must be purebred for some reason i was thinking it was a mutt but it must be purebred i assume if you have identical jangos yeah and two ghosts you're pretty close i think if you really got in there frame you know frame by scene by scene frame by frame. I mean, we're going to now but i did not yeah you never can know. check their eye colors in, the, in their tail the levels of fluff in their tails and stuff. <laughs> any contrast but they're well the one in the house in episode two is phenomenal actor i was just like uh, yeah that's exactly how a dog would act if your person was missing for a year yeah. and then you show up like yeah. don't leave aside when brian comes to the door when brian comes to the door and the dog yeah. Comes yeah and he's walking through and the dog's just like looking up at him and stepping foot by foot it's yeah just, i love that dog yeah we're big dog people it was a very good performance it was the fact that brian had peanut butter in his pocket no. Oh, <laughs> very good, very good. How did I not realize that? <laughs> we spooned peanut butter into his palm too before the take. <laughs> Do you really? He's walking around oh. with peanut butter in his hand. Yeah, if you want to see your dog, perf- you know, perform with loving devotion. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Express loving devotion. Put peanut butter. Oh, that's amazing. I love these. I love these tips and tricks of the directing world. Have you seen those videos where like someone puts like a bit of glad wrap on their head and like they put like peanut butter on their head to like trim their dog's nails what? to make it easier? No. <laughs> I have no, but I know exactly what I'm doing when we complete this conversation. <laughs> I'm assuming I, I have to like try and interpret her language a lot. I'm assuming glad wrap is like cellophane to us maybe, or maybe, maybe that is the brand here actually. Yeah. You know, like the stuff you put over food, like, you know, that's like annoying if it sticks together. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really annoying to put on. No, we're talking about the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. If you, yeah. If you spray for the name brand plastic wrap, yeah, it's glad. Plastic wrap. <laughs> That's right. Is it the same Django then from season one? Sounds like it. I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that makes me happy. <laughs> <laughs> so baby's good. Dog's good. I cannot even fathom the bull situation. No. Were you scared? Yes. For other yeah. people's safety, I mean, like, I am sure you were just <laughs> being the director in that scene. I can't imagine. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, the uh, bull weighs... A bull can weigh more than 2,000 pounds. Jesus. And what's that? I said said Jesus. Jesus. (laughs) Indeed. (laughs) And, you know, safety needed to be everybody's top priority. It was big. A lot of research and development went into how we could stage that scene safely. So we can talk about that. (laughs) If you like. Yes, we would love to know everything about that rodeo scene. (laughs) Okay. Well, first of all, that sequence is based on an actual event. Yeah, we we, we googled that. it and we were shocked. Yeah, yeah, it is very shocking, and I think it made a very. I know that it made a very big impression on Brian and our producers and the team. Mm-hmm. Um, the fact that that exists, the uh, the brutality of it, and the inhumanity of it. Uh, yeah. So it showed up in the script. We storyboarded it, uh, and every you know we tackled every shot individually and asked ourselves, do can we do this with a real bowl? Can we do this, or or does this have to be a computer generated bull? CGI, yeah. Or can this be a stuffed bull? <laughs> or can we imply the presence of the bull by shooting from the bull's point of view? Perspective, yeah, right. Mm-hmm. And all of those things are are in the sequence. Um, oh, wow. But there are there are there are many shots where it's a real bull, where Brian is in a, is really in a shot with a real bull. There were two bulls. You should know. So 
we had a you know a bull a real pro bull trainer and and uh animal wranglers cow men and women cowboys and girls <laughs> and um and real rodeo clowns you know because uh, these are the people that know how to handle bulls and we had two right so we had a baby a little baby Aww. bull which was a monster <laughs> <laughs> it was a 2000 pound monster. And then we had the big bull. The big bull was named Scarface, not by us, by the trainer. Oh, cool. And the idea was, is that if we could achieve the shot with the baby, we did, it was safer. The bull was e- easier to, to control. But if mm-hmm. that, if that baby bull was looking too docile, <laughs> we would release Scarface into the ring <laughs> to try to get that more aggressive performance. Uh, and we had to do that quite a lot. So basically what we did was we went shot by shot through the storyboards, uh, which you're welcome to see. Yeah, we'd love to. We'd love that. Yeah, and we hoped we can get it with the baby bull, and when we couldn't, we, we, we turned Scarface loose. And then after we shot all of the shots for the sequence, which took several days, we just released Scarface into the ring with stunt doubles, you know, in the, mm-hmm. performing the roles uh, in the scene just to see what other kind of exciting moments <laughs> this is. we could get. Knowing that the rodeo clowns were in there to distract the bull yeah. uh, and that the stunt men, in this case, um, were skilled enough to get out of the way if they needed to. Right. Mm-hmm. And it was amazing because Scarface really hit most most of the beats in the story. And a lot of that stuff is in there, too. So, you know, it wasn't like anything I'd ever done before. Um, and it worked. Thank God. What an incredible experience. I mean, okay, yeah. very few people must be able to say that they've directed anything like that. <laughs> Yeah. Maybe for the best. Yeah, probably. But it is, I, I mean, yeah. it was useful. Like I had no idea that existed. So it, it yeah. was, you know, it was entertaining, but it was also educational because it's important to know that things like that still exist in this country. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that's why it was important. I think that's, you know, that's why I went to great lengths to get it right and to present it. Um, is to bring awareness to the fact that, you know, this is something that's still going on that um we should make up our minds about. Reevaluate, mm-hmm. maybe. Yeah. How long did it take, just quickly? That was about a week. Okay. Mm. That's a lot. That's a stressful week. Well, you can't brush, no. brush anything that has anything to do with safety, uh, especially yeah, with course. dealing with right. bulls. Especially I, with Brian Cranston. Come on. <laughs> no, or anybody or any of the animals. I guess all yeah, of the I know. <laughs> and the animals. No shot is worth anybody being, right. being injured. Yeah, and the exactly. animals shouldn't be injured either, you know? Was it hot then as well? Just kind of looked hot. Yeah, that was actually California. Um, oh. And it was it was middle of the summer and it was uh, East LA. It was pretty rough. It's like inland. It was inland, yeah. You know, but, you know, the bulls, were, 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 I should say, were well cared for as well. You know, their work was timed. They got breaks. They had pens. They were fed. They yeah. were watered. I literally was thinking of a writing pen and I was like, wait. Yeah, I was like, what? Well, they had notes. <laughs> They hassled yes. Joey for script changes. <laughs> Some of the lines didn't work for them. It was a lot, but we got through. Thank you for telling us about that. Do you shoot like most of the location stuff in New Orleans? But I guess you just said that was in LA. So where, what do you shoot where, I guess? Well, a lot of the key sets, the, the locations that keep coming up that are interiors are built on a soundstage mm. in LA. So, you know, um, Bufa's bar, um, mm-hmm. Elizabeth's home, um, places mm-hmm. like that are on a soundstage in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. But, you know, just about all the exteriors are, are New Orleans. It just turned out that we were able to find a, a, a bull ring in east of Pasadena. Mm-hmm. It wasn't clear where we were going to shoot that, but um, L.A. had an additional benefit there because of the the uh, depth of experience in the stunt community. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Versus New Orleans, yeah. Yeah, no, well, they're there too. But, uh, you know, I, for, for some reason, when it comes to bulls, horses. <laughs> Specific stunt. Yeah, got yeah. you. How long do you start um, working before you actually shoot? Uh, well, I guess, you know, we prep for about 10 days mm-hmm. and, and shoot for about 12. I, I think that that was our, our model here. Is that for your block or for an episode? Uh, no, no, I'm I'm slicing it in half for one for one episode. Okay, one episode. And do you have anything to do with the location finding locations, or is that all done before you get there? Just being the first director, I guess. Yeah, I do. Typically, um, our producer would go out with um, uh, a location location scout, location manager Jeff Mosa, the uh, production designer, 
uh, cinematographer would go out and scout, mm -hmm. maybe take a sort of preliminary look, and then I'd go out with them uh, and sort of see the strongest contenders, uh, and we would, we would pick like that. And do you get to cast anyone that's uh, like new for the episode? So obviously you did episode one. Do you get to find any cast members that you like? Yeah, well, you know, we we all confer amongst ourselves, myself and the and the producers. Uh, so you know, obviously there were a lot of returning and a lot of returning cast members, but the new folks, right. um, for sure. Yeah, we got to we got to audition them and, and discuss who would be best for the part. In some cases, uh, chemistry read uh, mm -hmm. some of them to make sure that they would vibe well with our mm -hmm. uh, returning cast members. Is everything still taped now? Do you do most of your casting through like self tapes, and then you do a chemistry read in person, or how does that work these days post COVID? You know, for better or for worse, casting on it, it seems most television productions for sure are um, or streaming productions are uh, on Zoom or on tape. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, it seems that there is a momentum, an appetite to maintain that. Really? Interesting. I've, just, I've seen actors from Handmaids speaking out strongly, wanting it to be in person again, I guess, the experience. Uh, well, I, yeah, I completely understand that. Yeah. So I, I guess I had always assumed it was going to go back there, but it makes sense. I used to have an office and now I work from my home and save 50 grand a year. So I get it. I get the permanent changes from COVID, but I could see that. That is unfortunate in some ways. Imagine as a director, it would be a lot more useful. Uh, did you cast the baby though? I think that's what we want to know. We did. We did. We all cast the baby. We did it together. Um, and I'm so glad that he, they worked out. They, yeah. How old is that baby, by the way? Yeah, that's a good question. Now? That baby's 22, 23 years old now. No, I don't know. Uh, oh, guess, shit. Damn. Not, what you saw of that baby, we probably shot in August. And I think the baby was probably four four months old, something like that. Mm. Okay, we're a little off. Somebody guessed correctly. That baby has a lot of hair. Yeah. Some babies come out with a lot of hair. Probably <laughs> his they? baby did. Oh, yeah. Definitely <laughs> your baby did. <yeah. laughs> <laughs> I love a good hairy baby. What's not to like about that? No, it's it's my favorite kind of baby. Yeah. I honestly like I don't have a thing where I love babies and shows, but this particular baby has been has created a thing for me. I predict it's always smiling and stuff. Yeah, I think I think audience uh, audience award for this baby. Yes, yes. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about the scene. Um, maybe one of the first scenes you shot, I guess, where. We see Michael for the first time and he's getting that tube stuck down his throat. I wonder how, what was the, that like to film? And I'm really upset because they did not put that much like lube on that tube. <laughs> well, it was it was very upsetting to to shoot that scene. Um, mm -hmm. It was effective. It was upsetting to watch. Yeah. It was. Yes. So the first thing we needed to do was educate ourselves on how that process works. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was a video reference video we found where most deaf is force fed that way and he was doing it to shine a light on the fact that detainees at guantanamo i think were being force fed uh, that way, uh, when they were staging hunger strikes gotcha. so he had that done to himself um, wow and um you know we could see what the process was. We could see what his involuntary physical reaction was to that. Mm, mm -hmm. Right. And so we got a sense of what the beats of the scene might look like. Um, obviously, we were not going to insert a tube into Brian's nostril down the back of his throat and into his stomach and fill him with a nutritional supplement. <laughs> um, so the question then was how to, how to fake it. Yeah. Yeah. And how he could perform, how we could support his performance by the mm -hmm. by how we simulated it it sure looked real yeah it really it did. sure did look it sure, it sure did look <laughs> you know i you know brian's an amazing performer and he you know he's somebody who uh you know i've heard him call it a, a switch you know he can be sort of very casually talking about you know the dodgers um right. and the day action and he's he is performing with absolute credibility mm -hmm. a joyful touching moment or the agony of being force fed it's you know the challenge is you know it, it's just that it's hard to watch it's hard to watch him suffer because it, it is absolutely and completely believable right yeah but there's also a physical sort of fatigue that set in because you know there was so there was so much he was strapped in and there was a great deal of physicality to him performing that way because he's trying to free himself and he's 
struggling to breathe and coughing and wheezing and god that's an incredible performance like nothing is actually going down i mean that's amazing no no and we, when we were discussing it at the beginning how, of how to do it you know we looked at the video together and we were there with the you know with the doctor who was sort of talking about the process of feeding that kind of tube you know it's the sort of thing that could happen if someone was very ill or they needed to pump a stomach or somebody was mm -hmm. with anesthesia because normally yeah that's what kimberly pointed out why wouldn't they put you under but i guess they don't uh, right more more education more education um so he you know he sort of performed that gagging and then all that involuntary movement for me just just standing standing on the set one day and it was uh <laughs> i immediately knew the scene was going to absolutely work because it was terrifying yeah. yeah so you know i'm glad the scene worked so well it's a good hook for the season yeah. and i think you know a strong counterpoint uh for desiato for michael desiato and, and a counterpoint to the, to the way where we left him last year yeah yeah I mean, even the reveal that he was in prison was shocking. Yeah, because mm -hmm. until until we saw the white legs and the and the white underwear, and we were like, <laughs> tidy white. Then you, yeah. then you knew we know problem. we know those legs. <laughs> this is his yeah. thing. But yeah, it was a great <laughs> uncomfortable. The whole beginning was very uncomfortable. Well done. And I'm guessing you uh, made us think that that was an electric chair, right? Even though when you actually look at it, it doesn't look like one. But I was like, oh my god, what's happening? Yes, we were trying to provoke questions about how how dire the situation really was. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what exactly they were going to do to him. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. I then switched to torture, which um, was actually accurate yeah. in a different way. <laughs> yeah. Not for the purpose of torture, but yes. Yeah. Well, there's only one way to go from there, you know, from that scene, and that's out. Well, you're right. Yeah. True. I want to know whose idea was it? In the, um, I guess it's the grief. Is it called a grief session or something that Gina was in? Support? Um, grief grief support. support? Oh, support, like circle. a support group. Yeah. Um, <laughs> whose idea was it to make her sit like that with her legs spread like that? Wasn't that amazing? That was home. That was, <laughs> was home. That was home. Oh, was it? <laughs> Hope just walked onto the set and just man spread like that. And I just thought, <laughs> <laughs> That's what so an funny. amazing idea. It's so perfect. Yeah, totally. What a great way to own the space. Yeah. Um, no, that was Hope. Oh, it's amazing. She's amazing. I hate her so much. And I feel bad yeah. because that just means she's an incredible actress. That's really <laughs> funny. That was her idea. Brilliant. No, I know. We didn't even address it. There was nothing verbalized. She just did it. And I was just in love with the choice. And, you know, it yeah. worked so well. <laughs> no notes. Yeah. I mean, along with everything else she's doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Incredible character. So I really love Shawshank Redemption and the similarities in Michael's prison release to Brooks. I would like to, was that written into the script? Was it a directing idea or am I just seeing things that I want to see because I'm too obsessed with Shawshank? Yeah, no, I, it was, uh, Shawshank was definitely a reference that Joey brought up Shawshank. He's a, okay. he's a fan and it was a reference that we discussed in advance of, uh, of the episode. So yeah, no, you're not imagining that. It was definitely a touchstone <laughs> for us. It was an inspiration. Also was... Um, Dead Man Walking. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Makes sense with the walk and the, yeah. I have to thank you because I was listening to the previous episode, your previous episode. Thank you. And, you know, you were calling out certain shots with specificity. And one of them was the one where Michael's looking into the glass and we can see Fia's reflection mm -hmm. in it. So you can see great shot. both of them in a two shot as opposed to having to intercut between them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a lot goes into something like that because to turn a piece of glass like that into a mirror, you need to surround that piece of glass with a dark surface. That's how we create a mirror. Um, okay. Put a piece of glass against something black. So what we did was paint that entire room black so uh -huh. that Fia's face would be reflected in the mirror. So Fia's face would be reflected in the glass yeah, as right. if it were a mirror. As if it was a mirror, yeah. We were looking at Michael Desiato. That's so yeah. interesting. The whole room. Yeah, because there couldn't be, because we needed to, we, we couldn't have light bouncing off of any of the walls. What we want was light bouncing off of that piece of glass. Mm -hmm. So thank you for calling that out. You know, one of the things, I mean, having made for features and much television, you know, one of the things we experience when we direct television is that there is not the same sort of venue to discuss the craft of directing as there is mm -hmm. when you direct a feature. Mm -hmm. And you bringing up the details of the craft and the creative choices of the team and the contributions of the creative mm -hmm. team helps to maintain an awareness and appreciation of the craft of directing and of the craft of filmmaking. And that is really what we talk about when we try to distinguish, you know, I don't know what, hour-long movies 
pre premium streaming television, mm -hmm. whatever it is, uh, from things that do not have a visual language or do not aspire to have a visual language. So right. thank you for pointing some of these things out, time and, and effort and creativity and inspiration and film history and visual literacy all figure into creating a shot like that. So thank you for observing. It's beautiful. No worries. Yes. Um, thank you for doing it. But but it is notable overall, the yeah. overall product, like mm -hmm. you're saying, versus other television shows that it's so much more cinematically. There, yeah, there are so many. Aesthetically pleasing. Yeah, especially in those first two episodes, you can see, because um, I'm a visual person, I I make like the graphics collages and stuff like that. And I go through like all the screenshots and I love like looking through just the ones that are shot differently, you know, it's like not same old, same old. And you see like really unique kind of shots and it always catches my eye. So thank you for that. And thank the rest of the crew. Yes, yes, of course. I mean, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, Jeff Mosa, and Michael Grady, DP and, and, and production designer, should be acknowledged. And Annette, mm -hmm. let's see, the work of Annette Helmick, uh, who's the cinematographer of episodes five and six, who did a gorgeous job as well. You know, the, the team is worth being acknowledged, so thank you for calling them out. Yes. So as far as like that shot with Fia, is that the cinematographer's idea? Is that the two of you working together? How, how did those come about? I mean, you know, it, it's, you know, there's been an awful lot of scenes set in uh, prison uh, meeting rooms, you know, it, it's sort of a, it's a classic of a prison <laughs> genre. So if you're me and you read that scene, my mind starts to make associations, you know, who's done this really well, uh, who's done it really mm -hmm. well in a way that uh, could support what Joey's written here, or the way that Brian or or Lily Kay are performing it here. How can I use mm -hmm. what I've seen to contribute to this, to elevate it in some way, you know, to try to capture what's being written and, and performed. And what came to mind there was the scene in, in, in uh, Dead Man Walking, which is the same thing. You know, there happens, there's a conveniently placed piece of dark wood behind Sean Penn's head <laughs> in that scene yeah. that turns that window into a mirror. Right. And it saves the scene from being overly cutty. And it saves mm -hmm. the scene from being uh, a dialogue scene full of close-ups. It allows us to see the two actors interacting in one frame. Mm -hmm. And that's good for performance. Yeah. We spoke to a cinematographer on on Handmaids, and she actually said that she and the director, which was Lizzie, I think, for those, that they actually spent a lot of time like watching old movies to try. They were trying to go for, I think, a horror esque feel for that. Mm -hmm. Is there that kind of discussion when you're prepping for these scenes for your block? Do you say like between the cinematographer and you, is there a lot of film discussion? Yeah, there is, and I'm, and I'm pulling a lot of images um, or referencing, you know chase sequences, yeah. uh, for instance. But yeah, you know, usually I'm showing up with an awful lot of pictures. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and sometimes the scene winds up being staged in a way where those pictures are no longer relevant. Sometimes right. the scene is staged in a way where uh, one of those pictures become very handy. Uh, and you realize, you know, you can utilize that to elevate the scene in some way. Or you can take or you can take that reference and build, build on it and take it somewhere new. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's sort of the fun of it you know the 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 idea that it isn't ever going to be exactly what you think is what makes this interesting mm -hmm. one of my um favorite scenes from both seasons is definitely um from episode two when michael comes back inside after nancy kind of like stalks him outside and he comes inside and he picks up the belt just the lighting in that scene and you know all the angles you used and you know the belt where he's looking through it like mm -hmm. it was so good like cool yeah shot. it was just it was just amazing thanks yeah michael uh, michael grady who who was the cinematographer on that one did a really beautiful job of lighting that you know we knew it was going to be dark but of course the nuance he really did a beautiful job of rendering it's a funny thing somebody any scene where we have the opportunity to do any visual storytelling becomes very interesting how do we visually express that he's thinking about hanging himself what does that look like you know well I guess what we knew is is that you know that we needed that leash yeah we needed the audience to make the a visual association between that leash and a noose yeah. yeah Brian did a really beautiful job of performing that yeah it was amazing you know scenes like that can really give you the sense that you're alone in a room with a performer and yeah. to be alone in a room being performed for by Brian um, it's a powerful thing.
Mm-hmm. And Django. And Django. Django makes a quick exit out of that scene. Django though. saves the scene. He does. He breaks the scene. tension. Well, he, sa- he saves Brian. Right? He, yeah, oh, he sorry. Right. Brian. He enters at the end of the scene. Yeah. End, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he saves him. Yes. As doggies are wont to do. Um, <laughs> that prison. So is it filmed at a prison that's no longer in use or how does that work? That is a prison in the center of New Orleans. It's an urban prison. Oh, really? Um, and we shot the exterior in Los Angeles and with some CGI assistance mm-hmm. presented as something that was in rural Louisiana. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a combination. I mean, you know, this is part of part of the magic, you know, is you can shoot half a scene in, in one side of the country. Yeah, you can shoot one side of the room in Louisiana and the other side of the room in, in California. And if the actors are performing it. Yeah. And it looks seamless. And it looks seamless. Yeah. Movie magic. Uh, one of my favorite scenes is when Lil Mo is talking to Big Mo and says, Lil Man got away. And then the camera like pans to him slowly walking to the bus and looking back like hesitantly. I really love that scene. Also, how much money did he give him? Because that looked like a lot of money. Oh, yeah. Please tell him. I didn't count it. It looked like a few grand. <laughs> <laughs> is that all? It was hundreds and it was thick. Yeah. Anyway, I love the way that that was shot. too. He is fantastic. Um, you know, and I think as much as the show, you know, gives us an opportunity to see some of our favorite actors uh, or to be reunited with our favorite actors, it really has some mm-hmm. amazing discoveries. Uh, and Keith is yeah. he's fantastic. He's, mm-hmm. he's my favorite through the first couple. I don't know. I'm, I'm having some doubts in three, but <laughs> not Keith. Lil Mo. <laughs> yeah. Keith's amazing. Lil Mo. Yeah. Well, no, he goes, he goes someplace quite fantastic. He's got a long way to go. You're going to get a lot more of him and it's delicious. Yay. Nice. I can't Did wait. Did you um, get a hand in casting um, his two sidekicks this season, Desire Crew? Kelvin and Chief. Kelvin and Chief. Yeah. Chief, yeah. He wears his own Chief necklace, we learned. Yeah, we saw he that. He does wear his own. Who gave that up? <laughs> yeah, he's got his own uh, diamond. Was, we saw it on Insta. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Instagram. <laughs> so, yeah, no, it's very convenient. You, can, you never forget his name. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it does work. Oh, one of the, I was wondering, one of the favorite, my favorite sets was the butcher. Is that real or did you guys design that? That is a real, <laughs> that is a, <laughs> that is a German sausage factory. Oh, wow. In uh, Burbank in Los Angeles. Die. <laughs> that our art department dressed to be, to be the butcher shop in New Orleans. She's quite taken with it. Yeah, are all those awards like the Sausage Factory Awards or are they like for on the show only? Those are awards for their sausages. Damn. Aww. We'll have to visit. They must be good sausages. There's lots of awards on that wall. <laughs> I'm not a big sausage fan, but I'm told that if you're a German sausage lover, <laughs> that's your place. Sadly, not my thing either, but I'm very <laughs> happy for them for winning so many awards. I know. It's interesting in the back, back room to see how the sausage is made. It's oh, true. you don't want to see how so the sausage gross. is made. <laughs> true what they say. You don't, you don't want to know. Enough said. Yeah, yeah, enough said. In episode two, Elizabeth talks about a flower that only blooms once a year. Did you pick that flower that's for a specific reason? Like, is there a meaning behind it? No, I just think that it's... Um, oh, we would have to ask, you know, Joey and the... Joey and the writers, um, Sirius is what she calls it. I think it's really just about survival and the cyclical nature of life. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what appears to be death might just be dormancy and that mm-hmm. there's the possibility of resurrection for him in the same way that Sirius resurrects. So Adam's coming back? <laughs> Adam, yeah, Adam's coming back. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, he's been, in a, he's been in a coma. He's in, he's in uh, the Baxter closet. I mean, they did say there's bodies coming out of the ground. So now I see we, we weren't listening, foreshadowing. Adam was trying real hard in the first season to not get away with it. It was stressing yeah. me out a bit. And now Eugene is doing the same thing. So <laughs> not feeling great about the future, little man. We shall find <laughs> out. I mean, what do you think is going to happen? Oh, I think he's going to die, similar to Adam. Why do you think he's going to die? They can't kill him off, surely. Because Adam died? Yeah, but that's what I mean. He died. I mean, people are going to die before the end. Who do you think is going to Who do you think's gonna die, Kimberly? Hmm. I don't know if he's going to die, but I think Carlo's going to get um, a hit. Carlo might die. At some point. Carlo's not super smart. Carlo might bite it. Yeah. Hmm. He's pretty impulsive. Yeah. 
that guy. Carl on you, Gina. I really want to see, um, what I really want to see is Gina and um, Jimmy's, like, back history. I don't know if we'll get it because, like, obviously we've only got so many episodes, but I'd love to see how they met and, like, the whole dynamic is just interesting to me. I don't think they do flashbacks, right? Except for maybe the first episode, if we count that. Yeah. I believe the only flashback was in episode one, season two, episode one. Yeah, mm. so you're going to have to live without that, Kimberly, but... Um, That's upsetting. They have a shitty marriage. I can sum it up for you. I'm sure at some point it was beautiful before Rocco died. Okay, I'm bringing Scarlett over. She's in Puerto Rico. Hi, Peter. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thanks for taking the time talking to us. <laughs> it is my pleasure to chat with this international organization. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Okay, so my first question might be a little weird, but is the relationship between Gina and Carlo supposed to be a little off? Yes. Okay. I would not describe that as a healthy relationship. <laughs> is that like classified details or? No, no, I don't, you know, to be honest, there was no, there was no conversation about it, but it's, 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 it's the way that they're performing it. Yeah. You know, there's uh, actors need to fill in the backstories of their characters lives. So they feel they're on a firm foundation for performing mm -hmm. the scenes in the present tense. And, you know, I, you're picking up on something that the actors are creating uh, on their own. Oh, that okay. is unsettling. Well, that's interesting that it's the actors. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know that scene where Big Mo comes out after she's trying to buy the club and Gina's high on top, looking down. If you can talk a little bit about that. I thought that was really interesting the way it was filmed. Um, it was a pretty straightforward scene to shoot. It was just particularly well performed by Andrine and Hope. You know, the, the actors, you know, were so far apart. Of, we're at such a distance from one another that they didn't have much of an opportunity to work together. So they were sort of out on a limb because they were on different ends of the street. Um, and the editing of the scene makes it feel like they're sort of intimately connected visually. But um, I think that was all actor magic. Gotcha. That's another death I see incoming. One of them. Ooh. One of them's got to die. New Orleans is too small for both of those ladies. Mm -hmm. Seems like it, yeah. And Gina's not going to just, no. Do you film that at the same time or do you film one and then just like edit them together? Uh, have to shoot one at a time in that situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. On an open street, just off of Bourbon Street. <laughs> <laughs> so you said it was actually just fully normal night in New Orleans when Eugene was running down the street. When you guys film? Well, you can't close Bourbon. You can't close Bourbon Street. Right, that makes sense. Yeah, so, you know, what we did was we, we filled it with our extras in the center of the street because, you know, e Eugene was going to need to bump into people and Carlo was going to need to bump into people. Those needed to be stunt before. People that you paid and told about, yeah. <laughs> right, and then, but, but then around them are people drinking, drinking. Right, yard, yeah. <laughs> yard long. Pina coladas. Yeah, and they're all watching. You know, unfortunately, it's okay because the heads would turn in that situation where somebody's running right. through the crowd. And so it works. So how many extras do you get versus like, I mean, obviously, it's going to be a pretty full street anyway. How many extras or I guess stunt people do you guys bring in? I think we probably had 70, 75, but there are hundreds a lot. more oh. on the street. Everywhere. So in the That's wider great. shots, what you're seeing is our, our 75 people and then hundreds of people watching those 75 people. Well, that's really interesting. Did you have any trouble with continuity from the end of season? I guess not, because it was really just him dying, and then we don't see the street until... Well, Eugene certainly, Benji, who plays Eugene, certainly got quite fit uh, and grew up. Yeah, he did, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. he looked different. Changed his hairstyle a little bit. Yeah. But it works. You know? Yeah. This is the same. His performance is still great. But, uh, but if you look closely, you can tell he grew up a little bit. Right. Yeah. I thought that <laughs> Lily seemed to look a lot older. And Lily grew up, too, yeah. Yeah. Who draws Eugene's drawings? Oh, God. Someone in the art department. <laughs> Fascinated by this. The art department. Yeah. Gotta love those drawings. I thought I, I only learned recently that James Cameron drew the pictures of Rose and Titanic. So now I'm like, oh, yeah. who's doing these drawings? I did not know that. I have to go that. Was it is it a good drawing? Yeah, it's very good. How did he find the time? That's a very good question. I think that's what like struck me. Also funny, completely off topic, but about that. It really bugs him when people say that they both could have fit on that <laughs> door or whatever it is. He did this entire like research project around it recently to be like, see, they couldn't have fit. I'm like, wow, you're really taking this hard. I don't believe I have, this, I have the same reaction. How does he find the time? Yeah. <laughs> investigation. I still don't believe him. I'm sorry. I don't either. I want to tell him that. Mm -mm. Anyway. All right, Scarlett, you have more questions. 
the other question that I had was also about a scene that I loved. It's when Charlie and Michael are talking um, after he gets out in the butcher shop outside. They're sitting side by side on the crates, but sometimes it was filmed from behind. And I wanted to know if there was the reason for that. There's a kind of intimacy that comes from those compositions that I felt right for the scene. You know, something a bit conspiratorial comes off in those angles. Yeah. You know, they're a little bit less conventional than being in front of the actors. Yeah. Uh, I think it gives a feeling of um, something illicit going down. In that environment, in that geography, it also had the benefit of, of showing us the bodyguards and driver and oh. the mayoral SUV uh, right. in the background. Uh, mm -hmm. It gave us a sense that those people were at a distance and that nobody else could be overhearing this this conversation. That's I love that scene. Yeah. I love that scene too. And I'm actually surprised we hadn't even talked about Charlie yet because Isaiah is amazing in this role. He's great. I really yeah. like him. I really like his addition to this cast. His accent is amazing. Is that his real accent or no? No. No, and on the subject of, of, of accents, you should investigate Andreen's native accent. Really? Which does not sound anything like <laughs> Big Mo. Wow. We will. We'll have to. Same goes for Keith. Keith does not sound like Little Mo. Keith is from Zimbabwe, right? I think I read. Uh, I don't know if he immigrated here as a baby. Oh, not him. Maybe. Okay. Here. I'm not sure. But um, but Little Mo and Big Mo both have very different accents in real life. Oh, yes. Mm. You should talk with them. I don't know how they do that. Did you ever dabble in acting before you went the directing route? No. No. I could never, <laughs> ever do the accents. I'm much too self-conscious to act. Good day, mate. See, I can do an Australian accent. You can't even do an Australian accent well, and you're Australian. I know, I can't, can I? It's really <laughs> <laughs> Before we move on to Nick and Nora, I just wanted to ask, what was your favourite scene to film? You know, I, I love the, the rodeo sequence because it was so hard and so absolutely unlike anything I had done before. How challenging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so it pushed us. It pushed me. Yeah. Were you fairly shocked when you got the script? Is that the first time you like, or did they, they probably told you about it beforehand? Um, no, no, I got the script and I, <laughs> oh, what is and this? I just thought we better start storyboarding because we need to yeah. figure yeah. out every <laughs> single piece of this, every single beat of it. Um, you know, and like not to be overlooked is a foot chase down Bourbon Street, a near miss of a streetcar. You know, that's, that's not nothing either. Right. And you got it in one shot. The Bourbon Street. Yeah, yeah the Bourbon Street race. Right? Yeah, there's a lot. There was a lot to that. No, I don't know. I mean, all the scenes were really a joy to film because the actors are so wonderful. But the, but that whole yeah. sequence was um, challenging and educational and it was exciting. Did you know the rodeo existed? I'm very disappointed in myself for not having this knowledge living in this country. I had heard of it because of a documentary about the Angola prison, um, mm. but I didn't know it well. But I, I, I had heard, I had heard of it. Yeah, and I guess Brian went to it. There was like a short on Instagram from Showtime that said that he had gone to it, and I think that the idea came from him initially. So yeah, him and the other him and the other executive producers went to this last season at some point i would like to do more research on this people get hurt like it's just stunning to me anyway uh yeah. raquel hi peter thank you for joining us today hello where are you i'm in england but i'm from spain oh wow i've heard of it yes <laughs> yes <laughs> your english is amazing oh thanks <laughs> she's very good at it practice a lot <laughs> yes you, you have no choice where you are no not really do you want to ask about Nick and Nora? I would love to. Just to say that I love that movie. I loved it when I watched it like many years ago. I didn't know, I didn't remember it being that old. But yeah, it gave me an excuse to watch it again because I found out a few days ago that you have directed it. And I was very excited about it. And it was a very long time ago and I remember um, like it was yesterday. So that was great. Talking about um, how you, um, how crazy it is to film in New Orleans. And I was just thinking that New York is probably just as crazy. How was it to film there? Like I can imagine it being really, really chaotic. Is it, is it really fun? Is it difficult to get permits? And I don't know, how, how does that work? It was hard. I mean, it was it was a similar situation. You know, you can't close the street in New York. Mm. You can ask people to not to walk in front of the camera after you say action until you say cut, but uh, then everybody kind of floods through. So we were shooting in East Village. You know, the reason we were there was for the nightlife. Uh, and we got yeah. it. It was crowded and it was chaotic. Mm -hmm. And people were always yelling at Michael Sarah and, and, and all of that. And at that point, they were just yelling super bad. So <laughs> yeah. would be in the middle of a scene and someone would yell, super bad, you know, and <laughs> it was a challenge. 
And then, you know, and then for some of the car scenes, we were towing the car, Kat Dennings and Michael Sarah, and then we were towing them around the East mm. Village. We had lights pointed at the car. The car was on a flatbed. It just requires a lot of focus to get through something like that. It, it, New Orleans was boozier, for sure. It was, <laughs> <laughs> it was a step in the East Village, for sure. There are very few cities you can drink on the streets in America, but they are notable once you get there. Key West is another one. I was going to ask about the cars, because there's loads of like, car scenes, and you pretty much just answer it. They, they don't drive themselves, do they? They just get told around. Yeah, I'd like to hear about that. There's a few different ways of shooting car scenes. Everybody's got their favorite. You can tow a car and put cameras all over the car or inside the car, whatever you got to do. You can have the app, you can get in the back seat with a camera or mount, mm. have them free drive like that and have them mount a camera on the car or on the hood. Not as safe. You can put a camera on a sound stage yeah. and put them in front of screens that make it look like they're in any environment. Or you can put a little crane on top of a on top of a car with a camera on it so they can drive and the camera's looking at them. There's a lot of ways to do it. So many options. Either on or we had the actors on a sound stage and we had these big Basically, these imagine enormous television panels behind the car, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and on those enormous television panels is the road going by. Oh. We had someone shaking the car with <laughs> a piece of wood, so it looked like the car was driving in the way the car was moved. Oh. And then whenever there's a turn, the actor just goes like this, twists the wheel. Cool. Weird, huh? <laughs> you directed, was it, it was Rosie Perez then? Brian in the car, wasn't it, when she was driving incredibly fast for him? <laughs> yes. That was a uh, a stunt driver driving in New Orleans, oh, okay. and we were chasing that car on a, a Porsche SUV <laughs> that had this little crane arm on it. So they were in one lane, we were in another lane, and, it, and we were doing this, and this was a stunt <laughs> driver, and we were chasing it on this car. But then when you cut to the footage inside the car, that's Rosie and Brian on a soundstage in California. Yeah. I always get mad at actors when they're like going like this and they're going straight. But I think yeah. Rosie did a good <laughs> job of like, you know, being cool about it. Or when they don't look at the road. Yeah. Yeah. yeah when they're not looking at the road, they're like, <laughs> <laughs> they're just talking to you. And I'm like, wait a minute. Yeah. You'd be dead. Yeah. You do see that sometimes. You see somebody looking at the other actor and never looking out of the road. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you did another one too with Fear and Michael, uh, Fear and Jimmy, if I remember correctly. Car, you mean? Yeah. I swear I've got a picture of Jimmy with his in the car because I remember really liking that picture and it's got like a reflection and he's on his phone and he gets a call from Big Mo. Right. That was, yeah, that, we did that on a soundstage as well. Yeah. So it was in a car. Oh, no, right. And you're right. He is in the passenger seat. Right. But they're not really interacting because she's devastated about Adam and he's occupied yeah. yeah. with the Big Mo. Good call. The only reason I remembered was because when I was looking at my favorite shots from the episode, that was one of them where um, it's him on the phone looking out the window. Yeah. Yeah. He's great in that scene. He's great in every scene. Yeah. He's amazing. He's great. He was in Boardwalk Empire, right? Yes. Yeah. This has reminded me of that a bit, but I really like the scene with Fia and him on the water talking how they're yeah. not like the others. I love their relationship, but now they're sad again. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's pretty sad. It makes me sad. I'm sure it's going to get really happy, Kimberly. Don't worry. <laughs> happy times ahead. This show is definitely going to be happier. Yeah. We always do shows we've done. Your Honor, Handmaid's Tale. They're very happy shows. What is wrong with us? Yes. <laughs> kind of tight. This is a comedy podcast. Was Shining Girls happy? <laughs> no, Shining Girls did not end happy either. Yeah, that's a, we have a problem. No. Oh, wait. Did... Not a laugher, Shining Girls. No. <laughs> are you working soon again, Peter? Or are you relaxing at the moment? You got anything fun on the horizon? I'm doing a little bit of teaching. I teach directing from time to time. I'm working on that. Professing. Where do you teach that? At USC. Nice. Yeah. Well, awesome. it's fun. And just kind of taking a little bit, of, taking a little bit of time to catch my breath. How are your menisci doing? Yes, we're very sorry about your leg. Your mm-hmm. knee. It's your in knee. your. It's in your knee. Yeah. Near New Orleans. I'm recovering. It's going to be a while. The knee injuries apparently take months and months and months to recover from. Mm. So. Uh, I don't think I'm going to be running down Bourbon Street myself anytime soon. But. Well, you know what? Your timing was good. I'm I'm impressed. You you direct your injuries well too. 
if you're <laughs> yeah. going to get injured, it's good. It wasn't last year when you were busy directing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm very lucky that didn't happen on set. Yeah, you are lucky. Or in a or in a swamp on the Mississippi River. Oh, could you imagine? I love that swamp shot. By the way, you know it was yeah, like three seconds good. or less at the very beginning. We may see more swamps. We may. I'm right. excited about that. Is someone's body going to get dumped in a swamp, Peter? I can't oh, tell you. <laughs> Joey will come over here and strangle me. Mm, don't tell us. I'm excited. I want to be right about Eugene dying. I The only deal breaker is Django dying, but I, I presume nobody would do such yeah, a if thing. If Django ever dies, we're canceling this interview. Okay? That's it. So. No, I think that would sink the network. They know, they know better than that. Yeah. In the first season, I remember watching and I was like, seriously, if this dog dies, I'm out. Because he got sick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, when he got sick, I was like, I'm, I can't do this. No. And you probably would have stopped. I, I might have stopped. The dog dying is... It's just too much. We were just looking at Handmaid's season one, like, writer's room board is in, in a book we were looking at. Mm-hmm. And they had a scene where Luke is supposed to kill the cat and they cut that. I'm like, why would you have ever done that? It would have been a disaster. Everybody would hate him. Well, that was in the that was in the book, right? It was, mm-hmm. yes. I just yeah. if you're gonna cut things from a book to a show, I think that would be like first thing on the chopping block. Well, they ended up cutting it, so they must have realized that it was bad. There is actually a website. There's a website where you can look up movies and TV shows, so you are pre-warned if the animal dies. You should look it up before you watch any movies. Did you guys see Don't Fuck with Cats? No. Oh, I've heard of it. Someone actually mentioned... Should we? Or should we avoid no, it? No, you don't want to. My ah. little sister, who's 13 years old, talked to me about this the other day. I was like, I have not seen this. How come you've seen this? Well, you know, you could definitely skip the gra- their graphic moments and um, you can skip those. But it, it's, you know, it's about internet vigilante. Internet vigilantes who hunt down oh, okay. who, who did fuck with cats. Oh. Uh, and it's interesting in that way. I might. Also, oh, it's, some, it's some people tracking down someone who's like posted that they're killing cats. Mm-hmm. Oh. oh, interesting. Jesus. And they define the guy, don't they? And I want to spoil it for you, but I think he had done something to a human as well. Is that right? Well, it, yes, it turns out that the kind of sociopath that would harm mm. a cat is the same kind of sociopath that would harm a person. That's the usual ace, yeah. Oh. Like textbook, stage two. I'm looking forward to that. Well, Peter, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. We really appreciate it. It was very fun talking. We enjoy your show immensely, and I'm looking forward to your next episodes soon. We have now interviewed husband and wife. <laughs> we had checked off fictional husband and wife with um, Ever Carradine and Stephen Cunkin. Yeah. And now now yeah. we've got our bingo square for yeah. life, husband and wife. <laughs> Thanks so much for spending a little bit of time talking and thinking about our show. We're very grateful. And, no, uh, thank you. Really fun. We enjoy it. Thank you, Pisa. Thank you. Have a good day and uh, take care of your knee. Yeah. Sure we will. hope your knee feels better soon. Get better soon. Thanks, gang. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. Oh, is that hair his? Is all that him? Did he grow all that out? Or is that all hair and makeup? Oh, no, that's all Brian's beard. Oh, it is Brian's beard. No way. Oh, wow. Yeah. Nice. I'm impressed. Outstanding beard. (laughs) It is an outstanding beard. Well done, sir.